that is the new window through which Ayurveda is being viewed today. How do we do this? There are several ways of doing this. I just want to give a few examples. But this approach, when you look at it through molecular biology, we should not expect any immediate results in the form of like biotechnology. It may come, it may not come. But some of the examples to, do, to give you, for example, we have a very fundamental concept in Ayurveda is Vata, Pitta, Kapha. Now these are a combination of traits as this audience knows very well, physical traits, mental traits, behavioral traits, even similarity with traits in animals, all these are considered in determining Vata, Pitta, Kapha. This Prakriti is determined at conception, it cannot change. Now this is fundamental in determining the manifestation of disease in individuals. A disease in the Vata Prakriti and Pitta Prakriti will be different. Similarly, the response to treatment is also determined. It's very fundamental. Now this, a fundamental concept, does it have a biological basis? Now that is very important. Biological basis means, does it have any biological evidence in terms of gene structure, in terms of gene function? Today we have the means to study. That's a very fundamental question. Or secondly, if you look at plants, in Ayurveda, the plants are anti-pata, anti-pitta, anti-kapha for neutralizing disturbances of various doshas. Of course, there may be overlaps, but these plant groups, three groups, when you look at them, morphologically, they're all similar. There is no distinctiveness. Taxonomically, you cannot find any distinction, but therapeutically, they are different. Now, is there a basis, a genomic basis for it? Or is there a metabolomic basis for it? That is again a basic question where we are applying modern biology to study an ancient concept. Take for example a basic procedure like Rasayana, which promotes healthy aging, aging without tears. Now, if you want to study that, you can use modern biology today when you give these Rasayanas, apart from the patient feeling or the subject feeling well, is there something it does to the body? Does it, the DNA chain breaks, which can be induced, they always heal. Nature has this, that is the beneficence of nature. If you cut your skin, the skin will heal. Otherwise, surgery would be impossible. They're always healing. And DNA also will heal. Now, this DNA healing, is it promoted by, we can measure that. Is it promoted by the science? That can be studied. Similarly, Panchakarma. You know Panchakarma is used extensively in this country and patients with, let us say, painful joints, limitation of movement, etc. They report they become pain-free, the joints become more mobile when these changes happen before our eyes. What is happening to the metabolism in the body? What is happening to the immunologic functions in the body? These can be studied. So like these, there are a number of uh, scientific questions which arising from Ayurvedic concepts, Ayurvedic procedures, even Ayurvedic products. For example, Bhasma. There is a great deal of controversy, as you know, about the use of mercury. And mercury, the use was Rasa Shastra. That was a very big branch of Ayurveda. Now, in modern medicine or pharmacology, using mercury in medicine is completely taboo. It is inconceivable. I was myself, as a medical student in 1950s, I can never forget, there was no oral diuretic in those days. So a patient who had congestive heart failure, who had fluid collected in his legs, hardly able to breathe, if we have to give a diuretic, there was no way we had to admit the patient and give him a mercurial diuretic injection, which was highly toxic. And many of us have seen patients developing renal shutdown by the treatment. Now, that mercury is being used in Ayurveda, like Magaratthuja or Rasa Sindhu. And if you talk to experienced Ayurvedic physicians, like Raghav and Thirumalpan, they will tell you we don't use it very often, but we use it. We don't see these problems. Now here is a riddle. How do we explain this riddle? That is again basic science is what will do it. Because if you chemically analyze that Rasa Sindhu, you will find mercury there. So you cannot convince anybody. The modern world, modern medicine, or the authorities, that there is no mercury here. But perhaps modern science has given us a tool to examine the microstructure of this plasma. 
which could not be done 30 years ago. Now, when you do the microstructure, because plasma preparation, as you know, it is a very elaborate process, taking several days, mercury and sulfur, how they are purified, how they are mixed together with the juice of eucalyptus alba and various other things. That is how it is made. Now, during that process, the structure of the mercury and sulfur, they change. Because what happens in this, a study done by Professor Roy in Karakpur IIT has shown, in the chemically synthesized mercury sulfide, there is only mercury and sulfur that exists in one phase. But in the Rasa Sindhu, prepared according to the traditional protocol, that also contains only mercury and sulfur. But it, it exists in four crystalline phases. And also, the particle size, there is a nano transformation taking place in this process. So when if it is a nano transformed, nano crystalline substance, its properties have nothing in common with that of bulk mercury. Now here again you find basic science approach to Ayurveda. Whether you look at concepts like Vata Pitta Kapha or a person in the laboratory, that's exceedingly difficult. The second question, which difficulty is, this study question to make a protocol which you can do in the laboratory, not only you can do, which can be replicated by many others. Now that formulation of a protocol is not easy because it involves modern scientists, it involves Ayurvedic physicians, perhaps others. Now third, you have to find willing, enthusiastic participants, first-rate scientists, first-rate Ayurvedic expert, both deeply interested in the question, such a partnership, very difficult to do. And lastly, most difficult to overcome the skepticism. Many of the modern scientists, they will simply refuse to have any look at it. They say, well, it is difficult for us to get any PhD students. Nobody will come for this. So most of them will flatly refuse because they want to publish. The ambition of a scientist today is to publish in high-impact journals. Now, this I cannot publish in those, so they will not look at it. And Ayurvedic physicians, they are also equally resistant. They will say there is no need for this. We have been practicing it, getting good results for thousands of years. We don't need this modern science. So this kind of skepticism, you have to overcome this. And of course, lastly, you have to find the financial support for this, which only can come from the government in India because there is hardly any privately supported research in India. So these are all the formidable difficulties, but I am glad to say that after some effort, now the government of India, uh, through the principal scientific advisor's office, they have supported some, of, some kind of research like this, which has made some progress. And now the Department of Science and Technology is formally going to support this from the 1st of April. So that opens a totally new field. And what is the expected outcome of all this, if you do this? First of all, the outcome, I would put it like this. If you do a particular study on dosha prakriti or rasayana, that study will open a hundred questions for further study. That is how science grows. So it is like a big tree with branches, constant ramification. It becomes a huge tree, but the roots are always in the soil of Ayurveda because the concepts, procedures, products, these are all coming from Ayurveda only. So you have a huge tree with branches, flowers and fruits, all rooted in Ayurveda. And that is a tree which we named Ayurvedic biology. That is the term the Department of Science and Technology has given the emergence of a new discipline which the world will take note of. That is the most important. And the second, after the entry of modern science in India, physics, chemistry, etc., even though Ayurvedic students complete 10 plus 2, they all learn physics, chemistry, biology. If you look at the Ayurvedic community and the science community, there is a, an iron wall. There is absolutely no communication between science and Ayurvedic communities. That is how it has been here. There is no forum where they interact. Now that barrier will slowly crumble as this d discipline grows. There will be more and more interaction more and more PhDs, Ayurvedic MDs doing PhD in science, vice versa maybe. So in so many ways you will find this barrier crumbling in the next several years 
and greater interaction, collaborative studies become stronger and more productive. And lastly, I would like to conclude by saying, Charaka, in his uh, beginning of the Samhita, there is a classification he gives medicinal plants, 50 different types, some for diarrhea, some for headache, some for fever, like that he gives a classification. At the end of it is a, a, num a certain number of medicinal plants and the application. That is how the table goes. At the end of it, Charaka says, Mandanam Vyavaharaya, Buddhanam Buddhivarthe. This classification, this table I have given is useful for the dim-witted average physician. Mandanam. But he doesn't stop there. Buddhanam Buddhivarthe. For those with knowledge, is to increase the frontiers of knowledge. That is what he says next. So I do believe that when we try to do work of this kind, applying modern science today, modern biology, to look, tomorrow it may be something else. We look through that window on Ayurveda, you are most likely to uncover new bits of knowledge, adding a little bit to the pre-existing knowledge. There is one way to carry out Charaka's mandate. There is one way to repay our debt to Charaka and all these great masters. And this is in fact in line with Bahamba Gandhi in his uh, commentary on the Gita, very interesting place, he says, as you know, Gita was an exhortation to Arjuna to fight. Regardless of consequences, you stand up and fight. But Mahatma Gandhi's fight was a very different kind, as you all know. In commenting on that, Gandhiji says, I believe it behoves on the children to enhance the legacy of their forefathers. So if you go beyond Charaka, Charaka may not have said anything about nanoscience. He may not have said anything about molecular biology. In doing that, adding this little bit, going beyond, we are actually carrying out what Mahatma Gandhi has said, enhancing the legacy of our forefathers. I believe it is our duty to do this, and I'm so glad such a large audience, large number of young people here, they will take home this message. Thank you very much.